Can we fully imagine what life will be like once Satan and the demons are out of the picture? How much influence do they have on us and our thinking right now? If you open Watchtower Library and go to the Watchtower Publications Index, 1986 to 2016, under the subject Satan, you will find a subheading entitled, Methods of Operation it lists 56 devices that he uses to turn himself mentally, emotionally, morally, and spiritually. Why can I see things in his own way? He is very Demons should fear me. And you're not a demon, are you? You may not know this about me, but I'm obsessed with horror. Ghosts, end of the world, things that go bump in the night. I love it. And you know what? I think it's Jehovah's Witnesses' fault. Everything is their fault. I mean, really, though, in addition to being obsessed with this fiery, gory apocalypse that will slaughter most of mankind, they're also really superstitious. Even though they say that they're not, don't believe them. It's a lie. You see, one of the first things that a Jehovah's Witness will tell you is that they don't believe in hell, and they're not superstitious like these other crazy religions. Like the Catholics. They're really proud of it, and it's kind of funny. The fact that they don't believe in hell actually serves to strengthen their superstition that they claim they don't have any of, because if there is no hell, then where is Satan? Where are the demons? So for the uninitiated, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Satan and the demons were thrown out of heaven in the year 1914. Don't ask. It's a long story. Great big invisible war up in the heavens that somehow only Jehovah's Witnesses know about for some reason. I don't know. But Satan and the demons lost. They're here on earth. They're right here among us, lurking in the corners, sneaking into people's houses in Lord of the Rings DVDs, and they are waiting for you to let your guard down so that they can whisper lies into your ears and draw you into the darkness. Oh, did I just mix up my creepy demon footage with footage of creepy cult people knocking on doors? My bad. Demons are doing this because they are royally pissed. They are pissed that they got thrown out of heaven, and they're mad that they're doomed to die in Armageddon, and they want to drag down as many people as possible with them. They are everywhere, and they want nothing more than for you to slip up so that they can get into your home with you. Now, if you were a very imaginative child, like I was, you might see them shifting through the bushes outside at night. Maybe you saw them peering in through the windows while you slept. Perhaps you imagined it knocking with one crooked finger and a toothy smile, bidding you let it in. And what would happen if you did let it in? Or if it found its way in without you knowing? Then you would inevitably find yourself with demon problems. And if you didn't take care of them right away, they would tear you away from Jehovah, and you would be well on your way to becoming a mentally diseased apostate. Which, hey, <laughs> you got me. Or... The demons got me, I guess. Apostate. A chill runs down their spine when they hear that word. When they hear the word apostate, they see a person that had a run-in with the demons and lost. They are no longer the person they were before. When you speak to them, they don't hear your words. They hear the utterances of demons and your hollowed out shell merely the vessel of delivery. YouTuber Alf's Void, who has no prior relationship with Jehovah's Witnesses, decided to take them up on their constant badgering to check out the Kingdom Hall just for kicks. She had a number of hilarious goofs and observations about the culture there, but check out the most striking thing she noticed. I was sort of distracted at the beginning, to tell you the truth. I was a little bit overwhelmed with the, the fact of my knees being attacked by everyone near me. And also just, you know, adapting to the environment. I was very much interested in analyzing the, like, all the, the people around me, just their facial expressions, what they looked like. I was just very, you know, taking in this environment. And the thing that shook me out of it 
like the, the trigger word was as soon as I heard the word demon, I all of a sudden, my, my gaze from the others just went right to the front of the room. And I was just sitting there like, holy shit. I was like, where the fuck have I gotten myself into? <laughs> I just, I could not believe the words that were coming out of his mouth. And he started talking about politicians being corrupt by demons. My mind was just so caught up on this whole d d d demons. I just, and what, re what really got to me after he said that, after he was talking like that, was looking at the kids in the room. Like I just felt, Oh, like my stomach hurt, like looking at these children being literally indoctrinated into the most absurd belief I've ever heard in my life. Uh, in this room, it was just, it was something else. It really was, it very, very unsettling. And yeah, that was a really bizarre world to grow up in. From birth, the presence of demons is one of the first things that you learn. A, B, C, one, two, three. Demons are lurking, they're everywhere, they're in your house, they're under your bed, they're in your books, they're in your friends, they're watching you, they're waiting. They'll snatch you up and you will die. But demons were often difficult to detect. Sometimes they would get into your house and reside there for a long time before anybody noticed. Sometimes you wouldn't realize it until the family ran into some problems that they couldn't fix. The family business wasn't getting enough work. The car broke down and you were having difficulty making it to the meetings or out in field service. Maybe someone in the family was having, shall we say, irreconcilable differences and the fighting just never stopped. When there was no answer for why things seemed to be going wrong in life, we turned to our doctrine. What could be going wrong? Well, Satan and the demons didn't want us making it to the meetings or knocking on doors spreading the good news, did they? If they made sure the business wasn't doing well, then we couldn't fix the car right away, then we couldn't make it to meetings. And wouldn't Satan just really love to drive a wedge into this marriage? That's when my father would stand up, exasperated, and announce, Now, Jehovah's Witnesses pride themselves in knowing that they don't do anything as ridiculous or superstitious as the Catholics do with their exorcisms, but I would argue that's not actually the case, because we regularly engaged in an exorcism of the personal belongings. After this phrase was announced that someone brought demons in, my father would begin raiding our bedrooms looking for whatever it was we brought in that allowed the demons in. Now, imagine being a very small child and watching this happen. Not just imagining that it's true, but really believing that there's a demon in that room with you, watching you, as you watch all of your possessions being torn through. The guilt you would feel when inevitably it was something of yours that brought the demons in. And it was your fault that the car was broken down. It was your fault that the parents were fighting. It was your fault that you guys weren't making it to the meetings and were becoming spiritually weak. But what if it really was? And what if whatever they found that they thought the demons were bringing in wasn't actually it? What if there was still something there and the demon was still waiting for its next opportunity to pounce? You know what's funny about all this, Fenton? I'm afraid of you. And sometimes the demon problems weren't as trivial as, you know, the car breaking down. Sometimes people heard a voice in the wind or felt a hand around their throat that they couldn't see. Sometimes they did see something. Something moved on its own. Or a figure materialized before them. The only thing that you could do in that moment was become very still and close your eyes and say to yourself, Jehovah, 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 until it went away. When things got this bad, we would call the elders over to help. We would tell them our problems and why we suspected demons were at play. They would tell us to pray, of course, and all of the usual useless things elders tell you to do. Make sure you're making it to all the meetings, go out and field service more, you know, never mind your car that doesn't work. But occasionally, you would have a more sympathetic elder. One that would go through your belongings themselves to see if there was anything that you might have missed in your own raid. 
Sometimes there were sisters who had the gift. They would never actually say this, the gift, but it was a thing. Sisters who could feel things, and they would come in and perform an exorcism of the personal belongings. Sources of demonic infestations varied wildly and depended suspiciously on location and personal opinion. It could be a book, it could be a movie, it could be a music album. Sometimes it was just a normal everyday household item that just so happened to have a symbol on it that they deemed to be spiritistic. Aha! I found it! Pedophile codes. There's your demon problems. It could be literally anything in the house. And of course, whatever it was could change from one location to another. Whatever was found to be demonic in one congregation could be totally fine in the next. But if you got rid of whatever they decided was giving you demon problems, prayed, and doubled your time in field service, your problems would go away. Until next time. Not everybody believed. There were a lot of people who kind of checked out when demons were brought up and only believed it in a abstract, kind of metaphorical kind of way. Have, um, have you guys ever heard of demons tormenting people? <laughs> Why? Because I've, I think there's one in the attic. Are you being daft? No. No, I'm being serious. I can hear it up there making noises on the night. It's just house noise. It was taboo to talk about, even in congregations after listening to a speaker go on and on and on about it for an hour on the stage. This is for a few reasons. Number one, you didn't want to bring glory to the demons. Just mentioning them in casual conversation was something like uttering the name of Voldemort or something. Number two, you were never really sure what other people thought about demons. There were clusters of people that would whisper about their experiences among other confirmed believers. And if you didn't already know a person, you were always really worried about it. Maybe you'd breach the topic by making a, you know, low-key joke about it just to feel out how they felt about demons. And then the next night, it's, it's there again. Are you sure you're not up to no good? Yeah, why, why would a demon be in your house? Don't you have to summon one first? I don't know. I don't The previous owner, maybe. And number three, ultimately, the bottom line was that you were worried about what other people would think of you. If you had demon problems, that meant you were doing something wrong. As with everything, the fault lies with you, my friend. If you had demons rattling your cabinets, throwing you across the room, you did something to bring them in. You would be labeled spiritually weak, bad association. You would be targeted by the elders who might not be sympathetic enough to perform an exorcism of the personal belongings for you. Only weak people had demon problems and you were well on your way to becoming a mentally diseased apostate. I think I should call an elder. I think you've gone mental if you do that. <laughs> So for an organization that claims to look down on superstition so much, why the obsession with demons? Of course, it's a tool, a multi-layered and very complicated tool that they use to control several aspects of their members' lives, starting with one, recruitment. Emma and I were so worried about a Bible study, Balesa. She had spent another sleepless night after again hearing a dead grandmother's voice, plus the sound of slamming doors and items crashing in the house. Their publications and productions are littered with personal experiences about demon problems. What's interesting is that Pretty much all of these experiences are of people who are converting into the religion. The setup is usually that someone was having problems with the paranormal, and the witnesses were the only ones that could solve their problems with the truth. See, people join the religion for a variety of different reasons. For some, it's the promise of seeing a dead loved one again. 
For others, they're just trying to become better people or better Christians. And for others, it might be the promise that their hauntings will go away. Stacy from Finland told me in a recent email, Seeking help for paranormal events in my life was a massive reason for me to join the JWs. The JWs were the first ones that did not think I was crazy. Again, remember, most of these experiences they talk about are of people converting into JWs. People who continue to experience the paranormal after joining are bad PR, because what good are Jehovah's Witnesses if their solutions for demons don't actually work? This is why members are discouraged from talking about demons after they've joined. It's not actually actually any real fear that talking about your cabinets rattling is going to summon up a demon. It's that you talking about it damages their message that only they have the truth and only their solutions work. You're proving them wrong by talking about it. Talk about demons all you want until you get baptized, but the moment your head comes above water, you better be quiet. 2. Fostering Elitist Mentality Palace are put an amulet on a baby's wrist for protection, but the terror continued all night long. Of course, it wasn't really her grandmother, and nothing in the house was broken, but the attack was real. People that convert to a religion are usually looking for answers that they can't find anywhere else. They've tried everything, what are they doing wrong? And here come Jehovah's Witnesses with the truth. What their answers are is irrelevant, it can be anything. Believing in Xenu never stopped anybody from joining Scientology. What's important is that it's different from anything else that they've heard and that the message is delivered with confidence. This is why witnesses often lead with the question, do you know God's name? Hey, you know what God's name is? Show ya, got it right here. Gandalf, the old man said. That was the name, I was Gandalf. Pretty cool, huh? What? Your Bible doesn't say that? Your Bible's wrong. This is a piece of information that not a lot of people know. Even if the answer is completely made up, it's different, and it seems like these people know what they're talking about. The witness's faith is boosted because they have knowledge that other people don't. They're elite, and this piques others' interest because they want to know more. They want to be elite too. So they begin to tell them the truth. There is no hell. You're not going to heaven. You're going to live forever in a paradise on earth. The Trinity is a lie. The more you learn, the more elite you feel. You're in on the secret. This carries on to the paranormal as well. You're not really dealing with ghosts. It's demons pretending to be the ghosts of your grandmother. You're fighting the wrong thing. Everything you've tried is actually superstitious and making the problem worse. This boosts the elitist mentality in both the teacher and the student, ensuring that the teacher is more likely to stay in and the student is more likely to join. Three. Erasure of culture and religion. Something else you may have noticed is that the most common sighted demon experience that they talk about usually comes from a person of color from a black or Romani country. The story usually goes that they were practicing as a witch doctor or a medium or voodoo, and as soon as they became enlightened to the truth, their problems with the paranormal went away. You'll also notice that the accompanying pictures to articles about demon attacks usually depict black people, either just existing or dressed in cultural garb as they partake in spiritistic activities. This sly dose of covert racism paints their cultures and traditional religious beliefs out to be primitive and barbaric. These cultures do traditionally believe strongly in the spirit realm, and JWs are not the first Western religion to target this. Pentecostal churches are quickly spreading through Africa, promising deliverance from witches and wicked spirits. Their empty promises are causing problems all of their own by inciting witch hunts and undermining the efforts to contain HIV by claiming to have healed people of it. Despite offering alternative explanations and solutions, Jehovah's Witnesses are still engaging in a common method of Western colonialism that exploits and erases native culture. Look at what their solution to demon problems are. The elders explain to Palesa that the string around the daughter's wrist 
is not part of the armor from God. Instead, it is giving Satan an opportunity to continue to arrest the family. Emma reminded Palesa of how urgent the situation was. But only Palesa could decide what she would do. Slowly, their culture's traditions are burned away one by one until they find themselves in a nice suit and tie or a Sunday dress like a good white Christian. But the cultural erasure does not stop there. Here in America, things that are deemed to be demonic include things like other religious symbols, the cross or the yin-yang. Sometimes it's nationalistic, state and national flags. But other times, it's something like Pokemon. Now, why was Pokemon universally decreed as something demonic, whereas the very similar Digimon was mostly ignored? It could be argued that Pokemon was targeted because it became culturally significant, just like things like Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, or Dungeons and Dragons. Strip them of their culture and they remain no part of this world, which reinforces their elitist mentality that keeps members in and draws others closer. That you're no longer occupied by Satan's influence is a bonus. Time spent playing Pokemon is time better spent working for free at carts and knocking on doors. 4. Scapegoats and Control A wide-held criticism of Jehovah's Witness elders is they're not really qualified to do the work that they do. They're not psychologists, therapists, scientists, or really even biblical scholars. But that all wraps up nicely because they don't have to be. If they don't have answers to a problem, they're able to simply blame it on the demons. Hearing voices, feeling suicidal, wife thinking of leaving you, remember Job, Satan and the demons are testing your faith. How do you fix this? Well, you start by not telling anybody about your demon problems, because that's bad PR, and end by working more often for free for Watchtower. It's always nice to have a scapegoat when you have no training to do the work you're poising to do. Stoking a good healthy fear of demons keeps people in check, because there's nothing more frightening than becoming a demon-possessed mentally diseased apostate. And because there's nothing more frightening than one of those, they also won't listen to what one has to say. We may ask what is relevant, but anything beyond that is dangerous. He's a liar. The demon is a liar. He will like to confuse us. So don't listen. Remember that. Do not listen. Jehovah's Witnesses out there, I know you're not listening to a word I'm saying. And what happens if you leave Jehovah's Organization and no longer have its protection from the demons? What will you do if the demons come back and you can no longer call on his name to protect you? For some, that might be reason enough to never leave or to go back. When witnesses are taught that the world outside the organization is controlled by Satan, that includes major institutions. It includes the media. It includes other religions, government, secular authorities, law enforcement, police. So no need to come up with any actual solutions or help for their own in need a tool for recruiting people, a method to keep people under control and afraid to leave. You know, for all of the hatred they spew about Satan and the demons, they actually have a lot to be thankful to them for. But what about the people who had tangible experiences? The people who saw things, that felt things, that might still be experiencing these problems today? Are they crazy? Are demons real? Does it matter? I think a second part to this video might be in order in the near future. I'm very excited to announce that I will be speaking at the Faithless Forum in Austin, Texas this year on June 19th through the 21st. I'm honored to join others such as Telltale, John Cedars, ex-cult baby to represent XJW, as well as a number of other incredible skeptic YouTubers. Check the description for a link to the event. If you're in the area and able to make it, I'd love to meet you. If you'd like to support this channel and gain access to some special bonuses, check me out on Patreon. If you're broke as a joke, no problem. Subscribe, watch another video, leave a comment, tell me your ghost stories. Until next time, Germ here, and I am mentally diseased.